Heterodorks. Heterodox dorks. Hello, TERFs and trannies. You are listening to Heterodorks. I am your co host, Nina Paley. And I am your other co host, Corinna Cohn. That was an oddly normal opening, Nina. I'm just getting normal out of the way before we start the conversation. Is that because we have a special guest today who is fighting battles on the frontiers of free speech on the internet? Yes. All right. Well, and because let's we're, going, bring we're going to have our... we have to talk over each yeah. other. See, okay, yes, phew, usually. we're back to normal conversation mm-hmm. on heterodorks. I didn't yeah. want to have too many lulls because mm-hmm. we're going to have so many more lulls or lols. It's all depending. lols today because yeah. our special guest is Joshua Moon, the system operator of a website on the dark internet called Kiwi Farms. Welcome, Josh. Oh, oh. It's, not, it's, not on the, it's not on the dark web by choice. It's usually on clear net on a good day. <laughs> So you said on a good day, I ac- I try to access it, and lately I have just been unable to. There is some serendipity in your scheduling, because in the last two days, um, there's been a significant setback. I don't know how you'd want to phrase it, but there's been a very big update um, on the, the fight to stay on the internet. I don't know if you just want to get right into that, or if you want to like lay like a foundation into what's happening, or... Yeah, from your own words, though, because some of the people who are listening may not have ever accessed Kiwi Farms. They may have only heard of it secondhand. Okay. Can you give just a, a very brief background of what your website is and then bring us up to date where you are with this battle? In as few words as possible, the Kiwi Farms is a 10-year-old gossip website. It started dedicated to a single person named Christian Weston Chandler. It... Um, branched out to many other uh what we call locales people who are weird who are online uh and who don't really seem to take the hint that their their presence online is is funny to people and or for many reasons they engage in like a back and forth with trolls online and it it's sort of like this weird relationship um and over years it it was originally just like entertainers on the internet and trolls and a back and forth between them and then at a certain point around i want to say 2015 with the introduction of transgenderism on tumblr the a lot of the site i wouldn't say even now it's not like a politically oriented site but a significant amount of the site became devoted to specifically looking at uh, transgender issues sort of incidentally it was not like coaxed along that way it's just that that's what became really big because when the site was it, it's weird to think about but when the site was started transgenders weren't really a thing you had drag queens and you had real weirdos who thought they were a different gender but like be- like before trump this was like a thing that really didn't exist so it kind of blindsided everybody now the the defining feature of the site is that there is a horde of transgender activists who are very upset about the site and who work tirelessly to try and keep it offline now. Just to clarify, because I don't want there to be a misconception, the site is not like a, it's not, a, it's definitely not like a turf site. It, 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 there are turfs who use the site, um, but it is a site dedicated to internet gossip first and foremost. And because it is very free speech oriented, um, there's a lot of politics. There's a lot of like extreme racism and extreme anti-Semitism and things on the site that people do not like. And I can understand why people hate the site, even if they agree with a lot of what's said on it. It's incidentally aligned towards a certain other certain other people like turfs uh, in some ways, especially in, in the areas of the site dedicated for women. Um, I realized at some point that there was an audience of women who are interested in drama because, of course, and the areas of the site that are specifically dedicated for women are usually very, very normalized politically, but are very, very engaged in gender issues because it affects them so much. I didn't even realize that there were areas of the site for women. Oh, the the purple boards, the beauty parlor. <laughs> women of all body types, Nina, including men. <laughs> including men, yes. Be penist women are, well... 
on, well, I, I mean, it's it's strictly it's strictly a, a female area of the site, and if um, there's rules that if someone comes in and they say things that are uh, obviously like inflammatory to making you know women uncomfortable, like um, especially because we have a there's like a kind of a game that I play where if there's like a thread about a female wool cow. And the distraction becomes about like, oh, I would have sex with her. That thread usually gets moved to the beauty parlor because those kinds of posts get banned because uh, women don't really care for them. So that's an example of how that area is specifically tailored for women. About a year ago, there was some internet drama involving a one of these transgender influencers named Keffels. And there were some accusations that Kiwi Farms was being used to coordinate not only harassment, but doxing and uh, swatting and death threats against this personality. And when that happened, this was one of the most prominent exposures of Kiwi Farms in the media. And there were a number of media personalities or gadflies like Taylor Lorenz, who started to put a lot of pressure on your website and on some of these backbone providers to remove access to your website. As far as I'm concerned, it's unprecedented that backbone providers would be coerced into removing access for perfectly legal websites. Can you tell us more about what happened and and the current state of your ability to provide services? There's kind of two phases to this. Do you want me to talk more about Kethel's or do you want me to talk more about like the current state of what's happening? Give a, a just a short background on, on the Kethel's drama. And then that's to me, that's least interesting because Kethel's is sort of already faded out of view. But what's a lot more yes. interesting to me is the, the troubles of keeping the website on, on clear. So it, it would be a, uh, miss, uh, it would be incorrect to state that Keffels is solely responsible for what's happening. Uh, Keffels left at the beginning of this year, basically. Keffels was a Twitch streamer. Keffels made a post uh, ridiculing a very progressive streamer called Destiny. Destiny is very, very pro-trans, but very mildly, uh, specifically in the world of sports. He just says that it doesn't make sense to have, I, I believe, it, I could be wrong, but it's something very, very mild like that, where he's 100% pro-trans identity. But with sports, he says, that doesn't make any sense to me. So Keffels gets upset, reports this guy to Twitch. He loses his Twitch account immediately for transphobia. And then Keffels goes on Twitter and says, Destiny, I took away your primary source of income. Leave trans people alone. And it was very on the nose, like, I have power over you. I can destroy your career if I want to. Don't ever mess don't mess with me again. It was like a threat. So everyone starts making fun of Keffels on the site. It's a big drama. And uh, Keffels eventually decides after a couple months that he's prepared a media blitz. He has friends in the industry. He has a dossier ready to go. And the triggering event is that police visit his house to um, follow up on comments made that were allegedly Keffels saying to uh a city council in I think London, Ontario and Canada that he was going to kill them. So the police come, it's a door knock. It's not extremely violent. Um, but this is reported to the media as a mat, like a door busting down. They're coming in with the hammer and the guns out like clear and guns pointed in everyone's face. But that was a complete lie. Um, then Jeff was also alleged that they had misgendered him in custody, which was also a lie. And there's video evidence that this was a lie. So, but this guy, the thing started, it culminated in Cloudflare, which is one of the largest internet service providers in the entire world, dropping support of us, which they had maintained for almost 10 years at that point. Um, and Cloudflare's loss is pretty significant because they filter out, they not only offer kind of obfuscation as to where you're hosted, because they show up as the provider, they also offer DDoS protection. And DDoS is a uh, criminal act that can disrupt the service through basically flooding a web server with either bandwidth or requests that disrupt it. So losing both a um, obfuscation tool and a security tool like that was a pretty significant blow. And it came out of nowhere because Matthew Prince, during the height of this double down, said we are a security company. If we are able to be compelled to drop services that are legal without a court order, then we are not a good security company. Two days later, he comes out and he basically issues an actionable statement of defamation, as far as I'm concerned, that says that the Kiwi Farms is the worst site he's ever seen. 
it is the most destructive, the most dangerous. The, it's, it's active. It's an active threat to human life is what he says. Does not explain how I never get a police like police don't say, hey, we found this post. That's an active threat to human life. We need more information about it. Nothing ever. Ha- I don't even get contacted by Irish police, which is relevant because uh, Keffels was in Ireland at the time. And somebody on a different website posted a picture of him standing outside uh, Keffel's uh, apartment with a sign with references to the IRA and um, uh, other things that could be interpreted as violent. But this was on a completely different website with just Kiwi Farms written on a piece of paper. And, but I don't even get a reference from the Garda in, in Ireland, or it's not the Garda because it's Northern Ireland, whatever the police are called in Northern Ireland. No credible threat whatsoever, but it's used as an excuse to kick us off. And then after that, Keffels declares victory effectively, because I think once he realizes that actually that's not the end of, of the site, um, and there's a lot more to do, if you want to really, really bring it down, he just says, ah, I win. Then does a lot of coke and a lot of drugs and disappears before the end of the year. And by that time, the, the Kiwi Farms is, is back up. So that's phase one. So let, let me just step in here briefly. Mm-hmm. The podcast Blocked and Reported dug into this story a little bit. And they actually interviewed the person who had initiated the the death threats or the bombing threats in Ireland that were attributed to Kiwi Farms. The person who was like outside of the house? Yes. Yes. And that person had nothing to do. They, they admitted they had nothing to do with Kiwi Farms on the Blocked and Reported podcast. So I'm, I'm mentioning this. I don't know if you had heard their podcast at all, but I'm mentioning it because it corroborates what you're saying is that there are other actors. Like there, there are a number of, I guess you could say, shit posting websites or, or communities that like creating drama. It's, it's may include Kiwi Farms, but not only Kiwi Farms. In this particular case, the actor who caused this was did not happen to be connected with Kiwi Farms. They were just taking advantage of a chance to create more drama. Yeah, um, he he posted on um, Poll, which is a board on 4chan. So it's like a t- completely different site. I'm not I'm not surprised to hear. I'm surprised to hear that we come onto a podcast and and talk after he calls <laughs> such an upset. But Katie Herzog spoke with him, I think. Yeah, that sounds. I think people told me about this when it happened, but I was busy at the time, so I didn't get a chance to listen. Um, so if, if you'd like, I can talk about the other half. I just have one question. When you say Keffel's disappeared, mm-hmm. does it just mean that like, he's just not online right now? Um, he is now he's come back and he's trying to stage a comeback, um, for his career. His career took a hit because he went online and he said like really dipshit things that people on the left were like, why are you saying this? And it, it, the reason why is because he was he he had crowdfunded a hundred thousand Canadian dollars for suing the police. Never sued the police. He's now launched like an ethics complaint, which is a free thing to file. Basically, it's not the same as a lawsuit. But he took that hundred thousand Canadian and he basically snorted it. So there was a period of time where he was off the walls. He was unhinged. He stopped streaming. Basically disappeared. And then in early 2023, he said, "I'm checking myself into rehab in Ireland at a fancy." inpatient therapy which is like a thirty thousand dollar program or something but yeah he, he basically just stepped away and then uh is very disengaged with what's happening with the kiwi farms now so there was a, a baton pass basically okay so talk about how you faced one provider after another removing services from from your website Actually, this started a long time ago because people can what well, there was there was sort of like a gradual escalation escalation of this starting from before drop, uh, you know, Keffels, because what happened is even though we've been using Cloudflare for a long time, Cloudflare passes complaints back to your host. So what would happen and, and it would also identify the host to you. So at a certain point, they've changed their policies over time. But basically, um, it started with a, a British guy named Samuel Collingwood Smith. His name is Vordrak on, online. He hated the kiwi forums he is psychotic i will skip over him because he doesn't i I think he's still around he still does stuff but he's not the main actor he um really went after like everyone in my family he went after everyone that i'm related to everyone that i've ever associated with really hard in really terrible ways and really put a strain on my relationship with people around me but he would also go after hosts. He would go after providers. So he would send a complaint to Cloudflare. Cloudflare would send the complaint to my host. He would also say, his current host is this company. He would go then talk to the, the provider and say, if you don't take down this website, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go after you hard. 
And there were people that were seriously financially harmed by what he was doing, the defamation that he committed, and the things that he did. Eventually, I, um, I figured out that if I wanted to receive the complaints that he sends myself and hide my provider, I could register as an internet service provider myself. So I founded uh, 1776 Hosting. I acquired my own IP subnet, which means that I was allocated from a, uh, a number register. There's, there's five of them in the world. There's one uh, on each continent, basically. And uh, I got my IPs. I got my company set up. And now, with my own IPs behind Cloudflare, if anyone sends a complaint, it goes to me. And it goes to nobody else. And all they can do is complain. So this was the most secure that we were at, and this lasted for quite a while. And it changed after Cloudflare dropped, because once Cloudflare dropped and people knew what my IPs were, they could DDoS attack my, my subnet. But more importantly, they could figure out who my uh, chain of command is for, because every computer in the entire world, doesn't matter if you're in New Zealand or the United States, is connected to themselves physically. There's a physical line that you can follow from your computer to my computer to any other computer on the, the capital proper noun internet. When you send packets, you can figure out who somebody's ISP is. And even though I have my own ISP, you can trace, you can do what's called a trace route to see what I, ISPs exist in the middle. And uh, when Keffels dropped off, I was reacquainted with an old friend of mine called Liz Fong Jones. Liz Fong Jones first met me um, during a area of the, era of the site years ago. I was running around Trans Lifeline. Trans Lifeline either is or was a scam. Their first directors were people named Nina Chabul and Greta Gustava. Based on how they traveled, how they ate, the things that they bragged about doing, we were 100% sure that they were inuring money from the charity for uh, financial personal enrichment. Liz Fong Jones is a Google employee at this time and tries to have the site deplatformed by sending very scary emails from his lizf at google.com email address. And then eventually, at a certain point, a transgender female to male, which is funny because they hate they hate female to males, the, the transgenders do, uh, named Buck Angel, uh, caught word that this charity is a uh, is a scam. So he demands a little bit of accountability, and eventually they find out that actually, yes, Greta Gasava and Yenicha Bull have inured $340,000 of charity money to their personal coffers by through um, their traveling, their uh, expenses. I think they bought themselves like a camper van, like they, they were living it up. And this was only discovered uh, in part because of the research the forum did and in part because of Buck Angel shaking the tree. And this this number, 340, I think, is filed with the IRS. So the charity filed under penalty of perjury that their directors stole money from the charity. And I don't think anything came about as a result of this. But Liz Song Jones was in the wrong to defend them. Uh, he was defending this, this these thieves, basically. Coincidentally, I happen to have a small role in this story. I don't know if you know that. I do not. So I had been aware of Kiwi Farms, but was not a reader of Kiwi Farms at the point at this point in the story. But I was aware of Trans Lifeline, and I was aware that there had been a number of adult trans people who were taking advantage of their mentorship positions with younger trans people, and I had been pushing for Trans Lifeline to start providing background checks for their volunteers for their suicide line to minimize the possibilities that sex offenders would volunteer and be connected with young people on, on this line. So I had been providing some pressure on the, the leaders of Trans Lifeline. And as part of this pressure, I had noticed that Liz Fong Jones was a donor of, of significant amount. And I had direct messaged him and said, I know that you are providing a lot of backing to this. I hope I can convince you that as part of their direction or part of their operations, that they should be doing background checks to protect their clientele. And Liz Fong Jones blocked me. And I was frustrated by just a, a complete lack of communication on this. And so I took a screenshot of the communication I had sent and shown that I was blocked. 
and somebody on Kiwi Farms posted that like within an hour of that exchange. I think that that was the, may have been one of the exacerbating events of Liz Fong Jones hating Kiwi Farms because when he started attacking the site again last year, he, he had posted a YouTube video explaining why he was uh, pursuing this sort of revenge plot. And I was absolutely flabbergasted to see that that screenshot that I had put up there had had anything to do with this this feud. I was completely disconnected from all of this happening. And it wasn't until a member of the Kiwi Farms Forum contacted me via DMs to tell me that some of my personal information had been posted to the site before I, I was even following anything on the threads. But uh, I, I apologize, <laughs> I guess, that uh, me posting a, a DM exchange that I tried to initiate with Liz Fong Jones seemed to agitate him enough to start developing his interest in revenging himself on Kiwi Farms. Just just for listeners, when you said that you had DMs and that you posted this, this was on Twitter, correct? Yeah, no, it's on X, Nina. Oh. Stop dead naming, <laughs> stop dead naming Twitter. X, stop uh, dead X, naming X. X. Stop. Yes. Okay. This is so difficult. Uh if it puts you at ease at all, I don't think that may have been a little bit of like a contributing factor. It's, it's something to show. It's nice to have images to show if you're doing like a presentation or something. But um, Greg Sava and Nina Chabal personally hated the forum. And if Liz Fong Jones was like a prime donor, I'm sure that they talked about the forum uh, to mm-hmm. each other. Uh, Liz Fong Jones and Greta, Greta, Greta Gasava actually showed up at my mom's house um, and then posted wow. videos of themselves at the range uh, shooting targets and stuff the same same minute. They actually waited because uh, I, I, I was had just come home from the Philippines, I think, at that time. So I was with her. Um, we went to, out to eat, and then when we came home, we immediately got a knock at the door, and I'm thinking, that's either the police or that's um, someone who waited for us, and it turned out to be them. I actually didn't get a chance to meet them because I immediately went to the bathroom. So I, all I heard was the door slam, and I'm like, oh, well, I guess it's not the police. <laughs> if my mom is slamming the door in their face, they they hated me, and they really wanted to intimidate me into being quiet. And uh, unfortunately, they I guess they got away with stealing Three hundred forty thousand dollars. Nothing seemed to happen. I don't know why Liz is upset with me that they stole his money. It seems like the, the anger is misplaced there. So they showed up to your house with weapons. Uh, not drawn, but yeah. they did go to a a range immediately after to try and intimidate me on on the internet, honestly. which which you know about because they posted about it. Yeah. yeah, on Facebook. Yeah, Nina, why are women like this? well women for some reason in the last five years women have displayed a lot more male pattern aggression we don't know why i could just be feminism i guess it's making women like the best statistic of that is how and i think in the uk they've shown that female sex offenses against children have gone up by like a thousand percent in like the last two years that's really suspicious (laughs) oh well it's the COVID vaccine. <laughs> That's probably a more dangerous opinion to say at this point. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm ready. I, I, I Phase two. Uh, Liz Fung Jones, primed, geared, outraged, takes over the job of Keffels at this point. They actually had, were friends and they had a falling out, probably because Keffels was on cocaine. Um, and... <laughs> Liz Fong Jones decides it's not time to hashtag drop Kiwi Farms. It's time to hashtag end Kiwi Farms. So uh, Liz, Liz, as a former Google employee and network engineer, is, to his credit, very educated uh, and very intelligent. He knows how to read a network map. He knows how to find providers. Uh, he knows exactly what moving parts do what in the big thing called the internet that almost nobody nobody knows. Even people who work in the industry don't really understand how it works. It's sort of like BGP, the Border Gateway Protocol, which is how networks connect to each other, is sort of like a dark art in in the the industry because it's something that was set up 40 years ago in the 80s has basically not changed at all. 
and the people who are silently monitoring these these routers that connect everything together are like industry veterans who get huge checks and aren't really interested in teaching people how how to do BGP because that's their they don't want to dilute the industry and it's not a very exciting industry you just sit there and wait for it to break and then you fix it right Liz is one of those few people who knows how BGP works they know how the, the internet is tied together and uh, he uses this information to find who our ISPs are now when this first started he would go to the ISPs and he would complain and there are many ISPs in the world in many different countries. So it's very possible to take your service and bring it to a different location and find guys who are very committed to uh, freedom of speech, uh, even in Sweden, even in Norway, even in Poland. And they'll stick their neck out for you. Then, But there's the issue is that you open the route table and there are many ISPs involved in connecting two websites together. So if the I, he figured out, and I guess he assumed initially that there was no way the big players of the internet would ever fold to threats, but he tried it anyways. He went after, um, initially we were with Terrahost. Terrahost is, um, a Norwegian that are based out of Oslo and they had five different ISPs providing upstream, which is a very good mix. If you have five I different ISPs in your upstream mix, that's actually really healthy. Usually most people have one, uh, one of the big companies, but they had a bunch. Liz Fong Jones and their, uh, his friends systematically, got each one of them to drop Terrahost. So, uh, not specifically Terrahost, but my IP ranges is that they just blocked my IPs on each one. So we went from five to four to three to one over a period of, of weeks and months. Then after, and it's, it's basically like pulling legs off a spider. They can, a spider can keep moving with a, a couple legs missing, but once you pull them all off, it's you're, you're dead in the water. So I had to find another provider. I did. They were in Canada. Again, email threats to them didn't work. Got ignored. Then he went up to the data center. So now you have an issue where the upstream mix was actually um, uh, big companies. It was uh, tier one providers. Tier one providers are providers who are connected to every other tier one provider. So they're the big players that all are joined at the hip, basically. They, because of the size of the contract with his ISP, would refuse to drop. So he went after the data center. The data center, also because of the size of this guy's contract with them, refused to drop. So then he went after the data center's other clients. He went down the list of all the big fancy brands that were on the marketing side for the page and went after them until the clients who were bigger than the person that had the contract that was helping me uh, said, you got to kick this guy off because he's causing us problems. And that got them to get kicked off. Let, let me ask, because d this sounds to me like racketeering. It, it, I mean, it, you, I don't know what word you would pr prescribe to it, torturous interference, but it's extremely hard to get information because once we're out, they never want to help. They never like these these people who are cutting us off. They don't want to provide me copies of emails. I, and I try to ask them, like, can you provide me copies of these complaints? And they never do that. I, I don't even get told. I usually just find out because my service is disconnected that I um am offline and they will never talk to me. They'll say, you know, you violate our AUP subsection. We're not going to tell you. And uh, goodbye. So I, I, it's extremely hard. The only way that I could ever even considerably sue this person who does have a presence in California, so I could, you know, garnish wages or something, is I would have to sue, and then I would have to get discovery. I'd go to discovery, and then I would have to put out subpoenas for the complaints to all these different providers, which is thousands of dollars for each provider. And because they're in Canada and Norway and the Netherlands, I would have to import those discovery subpoenas to all those different countries and compel them through hundreds of thousands of dollars of international law to do what they should have done and just send me the fucking complaints to begin with. So it's extremely frustrating. Oh, and, and one of the first providers to drop us was Zio. Zio is a DDoS provider and... I only know that why they dropped us because I was actually accidentally CC'd into the ticket chain where the guy was saying like, look, this is a bad website. Here's inform here's their Wikipedia page that says they're a bad website. We should drop them. And Zio is a tier one ISP. So it's one French guy in Paris. Actually, it's an American in Paris. He's pretending to be French. And uh, he says, we here in Zio Paris believe that your customer in fucking Nevada, United States should be dropped. And that's all it takes. They just agree and you're gone. And Zio is, again, a tier one, one of the biggest providers in the entire world. And uh, that was one of the first ones to drop us. Uh, it was after the data center and, and Terra Host that Liz Fung really just said, you know what, I'm not even going to bother contacting ISPs anymore. I'm just going to go straight for their upstreams. And that has been an extremely successful tactic um, everywhere. Uh, in Ukraine, we had a provider called Visas, which I still use for some purposes. 
very good guys. And despite the, and they're, you know, they're being literally bombed. They live in Kiev. They're getting shelled by Russia to live in a more democratic and, and free and open society. And then you have people from the West emailing them saying, uh, you should drop this person because we don't like what they say. So the Ukrainians are like, no, <laughs> we're not going to do that. But then uh, Liz Fong Jones can email their provider, Voxility, and Voxility uh, blocks her something on that. So here you have people literally fighting for their independence and their freedom. And th- their Western counterparts, uh, Voxility is British, Says no, actually, you're not gonna you're not gonna run your business how you want to. We we get to decide that for you. So the, it just keeps happening. And the latest one to happen is that um, I had a I had a provider who was in a data center in Washington State in the United States, and that's a big deal because Washington State has net neutrality. And he decides very tentatively, let's try to announce um, one of your subnets. So we do, and within two days of using it on the Kiwi Farms, mysteriously it's dropped. And it's a really, really big deal because that provider is a company called Hurricane Electric. Hurricane Electric is the internet backbone. It is the largest ISP in the entire world. They own more fiber optic cables than any other company. They own more submarine cables than any other company. They have 100 terabits per second of transit around the world. It is a massive, un- like huge ISP. And within two days, uh, they said no. And then their customer service said it's a violation of our AUP. We are not going to explain how it's a violation of our, of our AOP. You get no information. And I was in the guise of this. I've been around for 20 years. I've never seen this before. It's like it's shocking because it's what is the Kiwi Farms? It's a, it's a drama and gossip site. <laughs> and, and it's like uh, the the amount of things that have broken that people in the industry have always assumed could never break because they have been they have never broken in 20 plus years. It's kind of shocking. It feels like maybe the Kiwi Farms isn't the biggest thing, biggest violator ever, because obviously Cloudflare, just in case you don't know, Cloudflare and these ISPs, Cloudflare in particular protects ISIS. Um, the ISIS recruiting website is hosted by Cloudflare. There's a website I know of that we talked about on the forum that is a hoster of um, animal torture pornography, and that's federally cr- criminal in the United States. You can't, it's um, called Animal Crush. You can't host that, uh, but they do. Cloudflare does just fine. Um, There's lots and lots of soft core, like child nude modeling images or uh, photography sites that Cloudflare hosts that HE provides transit to, and that's fine. There's that sanctioned suicide site, which is basically how to teach kids how to kill themselves. That's fine. That's on Cloudflare, I'm pretty sure. But not Kiwi Farms. It's the gossip website that makes fun of troons, is is the straw that broke the camel's back. In the United States, there is a nonprofit that has been around for well over 30 years called the Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF. I'm, I'm very, very familiar with EFF. It's very uh, significant, the uh, charity. A- absolutely. And, and they've been active in the United States. Well, even their website says they, they defend digital privacy, free speech, and innovation. Have the EFF been in contact with you or vice no. versa to no? they do not return my emails um and what's interesting about the eff is actually when these providers started dropping us the eff wrote two different articles uh kind of in, it, it's in defense of the kiwi farms vaguely in the sense that they are against providers dropping us whenever they write about this they they dedicate three paragraphs to why the kiwi farms is pure evil and everyone on it is sick and disgusting and depraved um, and then they say, but no, really, this is fucked up. <laughs> it's a big deal. And then what's funny is that the last articles were actually written by two women. And uh, they, I think they anonymized their authorship of the article because, of course, on Twitter, they're getting blown up the nanosecond of this drops that is vaguely in any way in defense of the Kiwi Farms. These are cultural circles that I used to be very much a part of because I'm a big uh, anti-copyright person, free culture person. So 12, 15 years ago, I was very in this world. This is before I was canceled. I've been shocked by how quick the free culture, free software cultures have done a 180. I mean, they canceled Richard Stallman. Uh, they've, can- <laughs> they've canceled me. There's all of, you know, the whole Fediverse, which is based on free software. There's a whole culture there of blocking everybody. Um, yes. So it's free culture, but it's not free culture. There's no free culture principles there. And uh, yeah, I'm like, my my name is a dirty word. 
among these people, or it, it's a dirty word among some of them and everybody else is silent. And one of the heartbreaking things for me when Kiwi Farms lost Cloudflare was that the internet archive got rid of archives of Kiwi Farms. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think there was some deeper story to that too. I think that there's a video of a guy of uh, the CEO of Cloudflare sitting on stage like in 2014 with someone called Michael Yanka. And Michael Yanka is a former CIA agent who is the father of an Isabel Lor Loretta Yanka. And uh, IBJ is famous because she um, was the last person trolling Chris Chan, the person that I mentioned as the foundation of the site, um, into around the time that he was having sex with her mother. Wait, what? Her mother. Sorry, not her mother. Um, Chris was, Chad was having sex with his mother. Yeah, sorry. I know. Uh, pronouns. So <laughs> yeah, uh, and, I, and Isabel Yanko, the daughter of the CIA agent who's on stage with the CEO of Cloudflare, uh, was caught in contact with Chris. It's unclear how much Yanko was influencing him, if at all. Uh, but what was clear is that in uh, her Discord, in Yanko's Discord, uh, she was boiling small animals alive and torturing vermin and stuff um, and I th doing extremely cruel things. She was extremely sick. And this also was right, happened right before all the problems. And there's always this conspiracy theory that it's not um, Liz Fung Jones or Keffels. It's Michael Yanka trying to obliterate the fact that his daughter is like a sociopath who tortures, you know, mentally handicapped people and animals. That. Oh. Yeah, that sorry, be... that comes out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. You know, anytime that you hear a one of these sort of conspiracy theories, you you judge the person who's saying it because conspiracy theorists are, are insane. But in this case, we know that there has been one event after another of providers being coerced into not just dropping you as a client, but going against this very long tradition on the internet of backbone providers not getting involved in the content that they're transporting. So it, it, it does make you sort of suspicious. Oh, I, mean, I, don't, I, really, I really don't know what it is because it could be, I mean, a lot of people suspect it's the government just because it is so unprecedented and it's so bizarre because even if you want to take the hate speech angle and say that you have all this, you know, rampant anti-Semitism and racism on the site, the, the Cloudflare protects storm. Th there is. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's a fair criticism. It's just that it, it would be more fair if we had established that number one, that if that was against the law and that this was like a court order thing. But the other thing is that, um, you know, you have the KKK is online. Westboro Baptist Church with their God hates fag signs are online. No, no worries. No issues. Stormfront, very old, explicitly neo-Nazi forum online. Um, you know, if, if it was just that, if I was like following in the footsteps, of, if this was not the first time that it's happened, I would understand more. It's like, OK, I did something. Obviously, that's when it caused people to be upset. But it used to be. And I remember when I was like a, a young, I was like a very, I was very liberal when I was younger. I remember thinking how wonderful it was that we allowed people with these terrible ideas to speak their mind because I thought how persuasive was it to let the KKK and the Westboro Baptist Church to say what they want and let their ideas repulse people naturally. You don't have to censor them and make them a taboo. You can just let them say what they want and people will naturally not be inclined to believe it. And now it's like, with the level of censorship, you think, you know, if, if someone says that a particular group of people run the world, and if you say anything bad about them, you're shut down. And then as soon as they say that they're shut down, you, you provide nothing but credence to what they're saying. The, the censorship stuff is, is extremely weird because it's the least effective strategy to preventing extremism that you could ever possibly employ. But it's a it's a great strategy to scare people. Sure, yeah. I I mean, I guess yeah. It's it's a great strategy to ward off individuals, and I I feel like it's very personal against me. Is it's like it, it's like a, a endurance run to see can I uh, to see if these people have more more patience than I do, and I I don't 
it's weird. This has been going on since August last year. I don't feel tired at all. I, I, I constantly see new avenues, new things to do, new new ways to deal with it. We lost Cloudflare, and we didn't have DDoS protection, so I just very lazily scraped together my own little shield. It's not working right now, but I'm working on... Literally, I'm, I'm uh, minimizing my taskbar right now is the code for the new version that I uh, hope to release you know, this week. So I don't know if it is like an endurance thing. They're just hoping to wear me out or something, but it's not... It's not effective. I'm very, <laughs> I, I, I've said this before, but if I had just been left alone to my own devices, I probably would have gotten bored of the site at some point because it's just a gossip forum. But because there's so much to do, so many new things to learn, like I've had to learn ex an extraordinary amount about how networks and computers work in order to keep my site up despite the circumstances. If I was not continually learning new things and being tasked with new challenges, I probably would have been bored of the site naturally half a decade ago. How old are you? Do you mind if I ask? Uh, I am 30 years old. 30? 30. I think it was, I want to say I was 19 when I, no, I must have been 20 uh, when I started the site. When I started hosting the site, I, I, I took it over from, for, it was hosted on a, a free, like a free, like, you know, one click deploy type thing early on. Um, but I took it over in, in 2010, I guess. No, 2013. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I've lost I've lost track of time. <laughs> and did you start it on this free one-click thing? Uh, no. What had happened is that there was some drama in the community. Basically, some guy was really upset, so he started reporting it to the free host. And then I offered to actually host it myself instead of just you know moving between free forums. And uh, they accepted my offer after a couple of months because it, it kept happening. Well, I can well imagine what it's like being a 19-year-old and making a decision that sort of fucks up the rest of your life. Why? What did you do? I don't. I don't think. I don't think Josh has regrets, though. You have no regrets, do you, Josh? No. You're just more invigorated the more this goes along. I mean, one of the things that happened is that as a result of this, I met a lot of weird people. I was invited out to the Philippines to work with somebody on different websites for money. And then my expenses were so, my, I, literally my budget was so tight and I had so little income because I'm also one of the most thoroughly debanked people in the world. And I have been for before that was even a word because PayPal was one of the first things to drop. PayPal went fast. And payment processors as well. They went fast years ago. So I've had almost no income for a very long time. I literally moved to Ukraine because it was one of the cheapest places I could move to, to minimize my own living expenses. And as a, I mean, as a result, I've, I've been all over. I've had lots of fun. <laughs> I, before I, I did this, I was literally a software developer for a payroll company. And I know a lot about the Australian tax code as a result. That would have been uh, the alternative fork in the road. Do you ever want to settle down and have a family? Um, eventually, but I mean, like, even if I wanted to, I couldn't, I could never talk about anything like that. So eventually, yeah, I mean, eventually it'd be nice to, to, to find a place. I'm not sure exactly where I'd want to settle down at. I, I figure one day I'll just have to go back to the U S because as nice as like, um, Serbia and Eastern Europe is, it's, it's not home. I don't speak the language. I've tried to learn, you know, Russian and stuff, but it's just doesn't feel right. I don't know. I can barely speak English, so I can't learn a second language. I am the oldest person here. And these stories coming from the cow's mouth are so heartbreaking because when the internet was younger, it was like, it roots around censorship. It's uncensorable. It's just designed this way. You just can't do this. And now it's like, yeah, they're doing this. It just, it just breaks my heart. There was so much promise. Yeah. I, and I remember, I remember when the internet was young, because I grew up with the internet basically since I was like nine, I've been online continuously. And I think the reason why the internet felt so free is that the governments just didn't understand it. Nobody, nobody knew how it actually worked. It was the, the product of like a bunch of, um, like idealists, you know, tech, technocrat people who really, who really just wanted the internet to work, and the government didn't understand how how it worked, and they would say we have to censor this website, and the technicians would say, well, we can't really do that, really, 
because it's in a different country and they just didn't understand. So it was very ineffective for a long time. However, it was around, I, I came right at the, the tail end. I think 2013 was when they figured it out and everything started getting worse. And copyright was related to this because one of the reasons uh, the internet was getting broken, right? The the justification for it was like, oh, copyright intellectual property. Yes. And I was fighting against that very, very hard. But it has all I, come I to am a, As a result of dealing with people trying to DMCA everything on the Kiwi Farms, I am now staunchly copyright abolitionist. I don't think that anything should be copyrighted. I'm, I'm just sick of it. it. It's there's no there's just no way to have it work. And then you, like there's some arguments we made about movies and stuff. But it's like I really don't care if Disney makes another hundred million dollars. <laughs> I just don't care. <laughs> Well, at the rate they're going, I'm not sure that they will. Yeah, I really, it, it doesn't seem, their they're strict copyright stranglehold on film and media it doesn't seem to be, people don't want to watch the movies anyways, so what are we protecting? Um, but yeah, no, the copyright stuff, I, I've definitely been, I'm, I don't know, it's hard to explain my, my political compass, because I'm all over the place, there's a, I'm a little bit everywhere, especially in copyright, I'm just, I, I, I'm so, I'm, especially when it comes to like pornographers, like people complaining about images that they put out there to sell. And then people on the internet say, this is really gross or this is um, embarrassing or something. And they say, well, actually, that's my commercial property. So you can't, you can't point and laugh at that. It's like, I'm afraid it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Copyright has always, the, the origins of copyright were in censorship. The origins were suppressing seditious material because of the advent of the printing press. That was why it was created. And I remember a couple of years ago, a friend of mine in San Francisco, real big in free culture, I was talking about getting canceled for saying women don't have penises and I wasn't backing down. And he was like, but Nina, why are you doing this? Why? And I said, it's exactly the same reason that I got into copyright abolition. This is the same thing, right? This is like, we need to be able to tell the truth. It's like, it's just anti-censorship, freedom of speech. And he didn't make the connection. And it, it's so disappointing that people in this world who supposedly understand a critique of copyright turn out to be really into censorship. I don't get it. It's impossible to describe what's happened with people where everyone, that's the line in the sand. You can't say that men and women are different. <laughs> that's, that's where it's got, it's, it, I don't know. It's just like so insane that I can't sit and think about it. Cause I'll get depressed or something. I just don't, I don't, I don't even like commit any, any thought to it. It's just like, you have people who are very wrong and are very certain that they're right despite being wrong. Um, and it's sad. I admit that I am a reader of Kiwi Farms. Oh, no. Ugh, I know. That's it. Hopefully. So much for our I'm podcast. Sorry, it's over. I, I know you would be also, Nina, but you can't figure out how to use the tour. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's how we keep normies off our site. I have noticed that although there are some really lowbrow and deliberately offensive personalities that post on there, that, that post things that I, I think civilized polite people would not like to read. There are also quite a large number of posters to Kiwi Farms who are extremely literate and who I am convinced are prominent experts in law and policy and journalism on there because they, they write at such a high level and with such knowledge that I can't imagine that they're just casual people that are taking a few minutes to check out the website. So do you, do you know for a fact whether there are some pretty prominent people who are just slumming in it anonymously on Kiwi Farms? Um, if, I, if I were to like say, do I know if there's a specific anonymous people who are, you know, XYZ politician? I can't say that. I, I will say that I have been repeatedly surprised to see what content from the forum ends up where. So even though I, I could never put names to faces, I could definitely believe that there are 
very proud of you, especially in journal. Like for instance, I'll tell you um, one group of people who I'm convinced use the site religiously. Um, and it may come as a surprise. I'm pretty sure that the ADL and um, the, there's a guy called Will Summers in particular. Will Summers is a writer for the Washington Post. He's in a correspondent on like far right extremism. And he, I am convinced, uses the site and browses the threads about far right personalities. Because when anything happens with like Nick Fuentes and we're making fun of him, it's a it's an article. <laughs> it comes out almost immediately. So I don't know. I mean, you could just pay close attention to them specifically, but you, you see things like from the forum end up in his articles and stuff. He doesn't like me though. I tried talk, reaching out to him. Following all of this news, have there been any mainstream journalists that have gotten your story and and oh taken... that actually cared about what I had to say? Absolutely, no, none. Yeah, um, there was none have one... reached out to you. I, a bunch have reached out to me, um, but I, the like you read the questions that they ask. I think I even posted the last one that reached out to me, and it's just like, is it true that you live with your mom? Uh, is it true that you've murdered people? <laughs> it's like I'm not going to answer your fucking questions. It's very obvious what what you're up to, boy. Try to actually, I'll try to find that because I did make a, a thread making fun of this, and I can try to find you the exact questions that he asked. But I think the only person who ever asked me anything that actually wrote kind of truthfully on anything was like a small, like local news station from like Oklahoma or something. Uh, but the, the average journalist is not running, is not looking for. I don't even know what they do. I don't even know why they bother emailing me to ask me. What, what my kill count is and how terrible I think I am. It's like, I don't know if they just want to say, we reached out for Moon and he did not comment as if I'm uh, terrified of their publication or something. But uh, yeah. Okay, this is Allie Breland of Mother Jones. There was one, did the Kiwi Farms users attempt to SWAT Marjorie Taylor Greene? Did they SWAT Keffels? Uh, target of Kiwi Farms said that they were sin jacked among other abuses. Do you deny that Kiwi Farms has used this technique? Um, Kiwi Farms users have reported to be stalked, harassed, swatted, defamed, cyberstalked, sent messages encouraging, encouraging self harm, and dox people. Is this accurate? Uh, Kiwi Farms users specifically target the vulnerable and marginalized, homeless, transgender, and neurodivergent. Why is that? Like, uh, yeah, let me let me take time out of my. Phone. And then, by the way, at the end of this, he says, or at the top, he says, "I am doing a story on the Kiwi Farms. I have a couple questions for you. There's like 50 questions. Um, if you would like, I need a response." By Monday, end of business day. Like I'm, I'm like the, the like the Jeopardy or the uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire music. The intense music starts playing. There's this timer that pops up over my head. I've got I've got only a few hours to adequately respond to all fifty of his questions, or it's just not making it. In. My story won't be heard. Uh, so I don't I don't bother. I, I reply to these journalists and I just say the press are scum. And that's <laughs> that's my res and then sometimes they quote that and they print that in the article. I have advice. Uh, why don't you just send them on to Reddit? Because Reddit users definitely do these things. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I could. That's like, been suggested I, before. <laughs> but it's also like, what forum, what host of a forum is responsible for all of their users like that? It's like, they're it's like, oh, mine. maybe, maybe <laughs> Facebook. It. It's like, oh, wow, users of Facebook. Like, people actually post their murder sprees directly onto Facebook. <laughs> yeah, I, I know about that one. Um, yeah, it, I don't know. It's, it's just because, you know, Facebook and Reddit have millions of dollars. And if you print an article saying that Facebook is murdering people, uh, you will be sued <laughs> for defamation. If you make an article saying that the Kiwi Farms is literally out there in, like, uh, tactical vests and weapons firing on transgender people at parades, I, I literally can't. You can say whatever you want about me. I have no defense whatsoever. I cannot sue you. Uh, so they, they do, basically. They write whatever they want. And then, then that gets printed. And the, here's a wonderful thing. I don't, I, I'm sure you've talked about this or, or at least cognizant of it, but it's called the cathedral in my circles. And it's like how the media, like, media could say whatever they want about me. It gets printed in reputable news site Mother Jones. Then that gets referenced in Wikipedia. Like I, like I said, they could say that I, I've gone out there and I've fired into a crowd of people. That gets printed in Mother Jones. And then that gets cited in, in Wikipedia and it says, Joshua Moon once fired in a crowd of people. Uh, 
uh, citation number three, Mother Jones. And it's just like, and then, of and, course. And he admitted it on the Heterodox podcast. I know. <laughs> and then they can send that link, the Wikipedia link to ISPs. And this is ran by a mass murderer. Did you know that? And then they just shut me down without any thought about it. Because what am I going to do? Because they send me, like, say, well, you're a mass murderer. I have to go through and say, no, really, I haven't killed anybody. And I'm utterly, utterly and completely defenseless to the, the machinations of how the media works and that's why it's called the cathedral because it's like a it's, it's like a religion and it's worshipped and it's just taken as true and you know, you're utterly defenseless against accusations of heresy against the cathedral kiwi farms is the scapegoat of the internet you are actually functioning as a scapegoat like the yeah, rest you know, uh, the others are cohering you're you're taking on the sins of everybody else they've you projected it all on you and they're sacrificing you. Well, yeah, yeah in a way, because what they what they would like is a shutoff valve to any site on the internet. They're carving in the precedence that, well, we have precedence that every ISP in the entire world and Cloudflare shut off this evil, nasty website. And this website does evil, nasty things that are similar to this other evil, nasty website. So why would we shut down this website and then not shut down these other websites? So... Um, I really, I have to make it through long enough for people <laughs> to wake up to what they're doing. Because uh, otherwise, if I don't, then the precedence has been set. The, this this site went down because enough people were upset and they sent really nasty emails to enough people. And the the solution to this is very far-fetched. It's never going to happen. But we actually had issues like this with big companies censoring people. Way back when, in the 30s, uh, with Bell, uh, it's called Bell Telecommunications, and now it's eight different companies. Um, but not only did we split up the Bell into all the little Bells, but we also uh, instituted common carrier protections for telephones. So now, uh, if you're in your house and you, or your business and you get a landline, uh, you can do literally whatever you want on that landline, um, barring certain harassment things. But you can nobody can shut off your telephone number to your house. You do not have common carrier protections to your cell phone, so they can't take away your cell phone number. And in fact, they did take away my Google Voice number at some point because I would uh, allow people to call me on it from uh, on the Kiwi Farms. We don't extend that to mobile phones. We don't extend that to offices. I can't. I, like right now, one of my big issues that I cannot solve is that the Kiwi Farms is an LLC. My registered agent was harassed into not representing the LLC, and now I do not have a physical uh, place or a registered agent to actually accept mail. So my company is going to be in bad standing, or it might be already. And I've tried contacting lawyers and stuff, and none of them are willing to touch it. So I, I'm effectively, as far as I'm concerned in that regard, I'm being denied my Sixth Amendment constitutional right to representation because people are going after my legal representation. And they went after my attorney. They went after his clients. They, he was representing other people in different cases. And a fucking, I, the, I want to say the Wall Street Journal. Or some, it was a woman named Margot Marjorie or something. I don't know exactly who it was or what it was. But it was a major publication was calling up his other clients to ask their association with the Kiwi Farms. To try to literally try and deprive me of my right to an attorney, um, so they, they there is no low that they don't stoop to. Um, they really they if if you don't do what they want, they want you to be absolutely destitute, completely helpless, and alone. I have two important questions. The first is, okay. why is it called Kiwi Farms? It was originally called the quickie forums quickie was spelled c-w-c-k-i because c-w-c means christian wesson chandler as i mentioned people could not pronounce the quickie forums because it's a very strange word and uh, one guy in particular kept uh, saying kiwi farms so i like that so much that when we moved away from chris as the focus of the site we adopted kiwi farms as our as our name brilliant i never would have guessed that thank you <laughs> second question what can people do to support Kiwi Farms or this, or just, you know, the, the freedom of the internet, even if they don't like Kiwi Farms itself, but are rightly concerned about the precedent that's being set with Kiwi Farms? What can people do? So the two big things that you could do to um, 
learn how to get around censorship is uh, to learn cryptocurrency. You don't have to, I'm not saying invest your life savings in cryptocurrency, but understand how it works and understand how to acquire it and how to sell it. Because once you're plugged into that ecosystem, you can send money to people who are debanked. And I think like right now in the UK, that's a big thing. I think Farage was debanked because of his politics. So um, learning how alternative payments work is a big thing. There's no excuse. It's not hard. It's not any harder than registering for a bank account online uh, to get into an exchange. And often many countries have ATMs and stuff where you can just put in cash and get cryptocurrency. So learn how cryptocurrency works if you're interested in financially supporting people online who are um, removed from our polite society. And uh, learn how Tor works. It's not difficult. I know... Um, you, she said that you have issues with it, but if you just download the Tor browser, you can bookmark um, search sites. And interestingly, there's a caveat with um, the Tor browser that uh, is not well spoken. Because of how it works, you can actually access clear sites over Tor. And in my instance, I don't often have my network broadcasted to the entire internet. It's localized in certain data centers that don't have full internet reach. But Tor is smart enough that I can figure out what computers on its network can access your site. So if you were to try to access, like if you try to access Kiwi Farms at net right now, it doesn't bring up anything usually. But if you were to try to access it over the Tor browser, you will actually get an error page, unless it's broken right now, which it might be. The point is, is that if a website is cut off from the big eye internet, Tor can find a way to the little eye internet that it's still on and connect to it that way. So learn how Tor works, learn how cryptocurrency works. And I would also suggest, you mentioned the EFF. The EFF is kind of waning in its usefulness but they're they're still a good organization and the things that they talk about are always on point they rarely put out anything that i disagree with i think that there is a organization called uh, the fire that is a current up-and-comer in the eff sphere so the fire.org i think that's it there's also like the social media freedom organization but i don't have that one offhand i, I will say regarding mm -hmm. the eff I had been a long time annual donor and I wrote several times to the EFF last year, asking them to take a, a more forward and unapologetic stance towards defending this particular instance of trying to control speech on the internet. And I did not receive any responses back from EFF. And accordingly, I canceled my, my annual uh, donation. So I guess maybe one of the things that I might come back to is try reaching out one more time because the, those donation dollars really do matter to these nonprofits and they should make a more full-throated statement about the importance of maintaining a separation between content and connectivity. I reached out to the Internet Archive several times and got nothing. And I love the Internet Archive. I love them so much. But, like, they just shat the bed on this. Well, I, if they have big don donors, if they have government donors that are threatening to pull out for whatever reason, that could influence their decisions. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is strange that these bulwarks of the Internet uh, are just completely silent. Because it's, it's funny to me because I don't know exactly what it is then so, that's the most frustrating thing because you know people can post addresses they can post lots of stuff that people would find offensive i have never had an isp sit down and specifically outline what content is that they find so egregious that they cannot promote it that's sort of important in like a, a legal sense is that usually if you break the law you can sit down and say you did this and that's against the law and if you had done this that wouldn't be against the law and never, never once has, you know, this, this been outlined and said like, you could post this information, but this information is considered threatening. And I think it's because it is a logical contradiction that cannot be adequately worded that they don't even bother. They just see it and they become upset and they can't rationalize it or articulate it in a, in a, sensible manner so they don't bother they just say you violated the paragraph of our uh, acceptable use policy that says that we can terminate you for any reason or no reason whatsoever and every isp in the world has that clause we can terminate you for any reason or no reason whatsoever and you don't have any appeal against that 
Josh, we're very grateful that you made some time to join us on Heterodorks. What are things that our listeners who haven't been on Kiwi Farms, like what message do you want them to to come away with? What do you want them to know about you? Well, I, like I said, I feel like if you, there are people who are listening who are probably not going to like the forum and that's perfectly fine. However, I want to make it clear that if you don't like the forum and you don't like the things that are said on it, you should be aware that every single time we hit one of these, these setbacks, I see like, a, a genuine upsurge and and emotionally charged defiance in what people say. Um, every time we come back online, the first thing that people do is they spam the N-word and they spam things that would be instant bans on any other platform. If you don't like the site because of the offensive things that people say on it, you should know that every time you attempt to censor them, people are extremely galvanized in their beliefs. And the best thing that could have ever been done is to just let people say what they want to say because, like, it it um, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't charge them in in this way, and especially with the transgender stuff, it's like, as this happens, uh, even people who don't like the site look at it and say, well, this if this is really just because transgenders are upset, evidence about the negative effects of surgeries are are, are happening. And, and the regret that some people feel and the damage that this is doing to families and stuff, more and more people are, are able to specifically point to us who have no interest in the site, who never would have visited the site or supported the site in any way, or pointing to the site and saying, like, um, this, this is wrong. And it's souring the opinions of many people, many normal people who otherwise were apathetic to the plight of, of, of transgenders in particular. Um, so I, w- I would say always take a, a anti-censorship approach because to actually persecute someone just strengthens their convictions a thousandfold. Good point. Excellent point. Thank you so much for joining us, Josh Moon. No problem. Thank you for having me. Turfs and trannies, thank you for listening. Bye. Hey, everybody. Thank you for listening to Heterodorks. You can support us by visiting our page at anchor.fm slash heterodorks or by supporting Nina Paley at patreon.com slash Nina Paley. You can also support us by writing a review on your favorite podcast site, such as Apple Podcasts. Thank you.